All right, so uh, we're on this spiritual adventure on Route 66, uh, 66 books, Old and New Testament. And of course, last week we uh, headed out uh, of Chicago and uh, Illinois being the first leg of our trip, uh, five stops along that way. And of course, our, uh, our first stop was in uh, Joliet, Illinois, and there in uh, Joliet, the home of, of course, uh, Joliet Jake and Elwood Blues, on a mission from God, and uh, the corresponding book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. And again, um, looking at the fact that the first 11 chapters of Genesis, which set the stage for the journey, tell us that nothing is the way it ought to be. Uh, The rest of the Bible is really the story of what God does to fix that, and that plan, of course, set in motion in Genesis. By the way, uh, on this first little leg, five stops, first five books of the uh, Old Testament are often uh, referred to as the law, or in Hebrew, Torah. And uh, they were the foundation, of course, of the faith of the Jewish nation. And so we are going to hit all five of those here on our first little leg. Uh, This morning, we're going to head a little further down uh, Route 66. And um, so how many of you actually saw our fun little video that Biff and I made? Okay, not many of you. So every week, we're trying to do a little teaser video. And it'll be on the website. And you can go in and kind of look at it. But... This week, we, we, we asked a number of questions. I kind of I said, ask Biff a question, and then I wouldn't answer it. And I said, well, you have to come Sunday to find out. So along the way, I said, well, we're going to stop in Dwight, Illinois, on our way to our next stop. And, uh, and then I asked uh, Biff, you know why? And he said, why? And I said, well, you've got to come find out. Anyway, Dwight has one of the great restored old uh, filling stations from old Route 66. And so uh, on our way to our next stop, we're going to pull into Dwight and fill up. Okay, that was all Dwight was about. I just want to show you this picture, so I, you know, I thought it was very cool. Anyway, um, but our next stop is probably a, a town relatively unknown to many of you called Funks Grove. And uh, Funks Grove, there were two questions. Uh, any of you recognize Funks Grove from anywhere? Let me just see. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, one thing is uh, it is... Uh, um, it, it's kind of renowned for a number of reasons, one being that it was the first stop in a novel that I wrote called Somewhere Fast, which obviously none of you have actually read, so, uh, w- which kind of, uh, kind of explains the sales figures on that particular uh, book of mine. Ha- happens, to, happens to be my favorite book, and I'm going to give away some of those this morning, so uh, if you're here for, as a visitor or would like to pay 10000 for a limited edition, no, just kidding, okay. <laughs> Anyway, Funks Grove in the, in the novel is where our protagonist, who's trying to put his life back together and is on a trip on Old Route 66, so it's kind of fun as we're going through this that there's a lot of things in the book that tie in too. Um, but the other question was, uh, we, we filmed our little uh, piece down in um, uh, old downtown Littleton. I was driving by the other day, and they've put a bunch of new signs up. We, we live close to there, and one of them said, you know, Littleton established eight. 1990. And uh, so another question was, well, what does old downtown Littleton and Funks Grove have in common? And Funks Grove, for those of you that are not aware of this, is famous for its maple syrup. And they've been spelling syrup this way since 1891. So just about the time that Littleton was starting, they began to sell. Now, all of this, you're saying, what does this have to do? And I don't know, but it's kind of fun anyway. (laughs) So anyway, our corresponding biblical stop then uh, for this morning, obviously, second book in the Old Testament is the book of Exodus. And with a bit of simplicity, as Dave said, I I really think that some of the stories in Exodus are extremely well known. It's the story of the exit of the nation of Israel out of slavery and bondage in Egypt and on their way to the promised land. I imagine if you ask somebody, do you know who Moses is? Uh, or do you know who the ten, what the Ten Commandments? I think a lot of people could say, well, sure. I think if you ask them, well, where in the Bible do you find that? Most people would have no clue. I mean, really. Uh, it, but it, they are well-known stories, at least. And you find that, of course, in, uh, in this book of Exodus. Uh, one of the ways, uh, sort of a little way to remember uh, the book of Exodus, if you can remember this little uh, n- mnemonic device, is that what we call them? Okay, 10, 10, 10 uh, is really everything in the book 
of Exodus falls under 10, 10, 10. There's 10 plagues, there's 10 commandments, and at the end, it, there's a tent called the tabernacle, and we'll look at all of that this morning, but just a kind of fun little way to remember what's in the book of, uh, of Exodus. So last week, remember, uh, at the end of uh, the book of Genesis, uh, we saw uh, Joseph had been sold into slavery down in Egypt. Uh, he's risen to immense power there. Uh, in the country, and he saves his own family from famine. And at the end of the book, we're told that that the the family of Jacob, and there's a couple of different numbers that are given in the scripture. At the end of Genesis, it says that that Jacob comes down with 66 of uh, his, you know, uh, family, uh, not counting the wives of the sons that are already down there. Uh, when you get over into Exodus, it gives a number of 70. But the, but, but the big thing is, is that the family, uh, the promised family, that who God is going to uh, work through in this plan to fix things, uh, they, they've all gone down into Egypt. And it, it's been, when we uh, open the book of Exodus, having, you know, finished Genesis, when you open the book of Exodus, 400 years have elapsed. So, you know, think about this. I, I, you know, just to give kind of a sense of perspective, uh, think about American history. 400 years ago, it was 1616. And 1616 was what, um, eight, nine, nine years after the first settlement uh, in America, Jamestown, 1607. Uh, it's four years before the pilgrims even arrived. And think of everything that's happened in our history over 400 year period. Well, the same thing is true here. Things have really changed since the end of Genesis when we open up Exodus. Uh, A number of things, and uh, we read this. Okay, I'm gonna read some of this as we go along. Um, Now these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob. They came each one with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher, All the persons who came from the loins of Jacob were 70 in number, but Joseph was already in Egypt. Now, new conditions. 70 have become roughly 3 million people. And uh, we read this. Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation, but the sons of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly and multiplied and became exceedingly mighty so that the land was filled with them. So 70 have become this massive number now, 600,000 fighting men, the scriptures tell us, which is where we can extrapolate extrapolate and kind of come up with generally uh, the total number of Israelites at this point in time in Exodus, around 3 million. And the other thing that's happened here is that Joseph is long forgotten. And so uh, we're told this, that now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And the consequence is that by the time we get to the beginning of Exodus, that the children of Israel have now become slaves to the Pharaoh of Egypt. And the text tells us this, the Egyptians compelled the sons of Israel to labor rigorously, and they made their lives bitter with hard labor in mortar and bricks and at all kinds of labor in the field and all their labors which they rigorously imposed upon them. And so, you know, from this position of uh, somewhat of, you know, honor and prestige as the family of Joseph, now what we see is we see three million people that will become the great nation that's promised in Genesis. This is, the, this is the, you know, the population that will begin to become this great nation. And, but now they're in slavery. And they're not only in slavery, but they have multiplied uh, so rapidly, and there are so many of them, that Pharaoh has decided there's just too many of these folks around. And so he comes up with this idea that he's going to kill all of the boy babies. In other words, they're going to commit genocide. 
They're, they're going to wipe out uh, the nation of Israel. And, and I think, by the way, and I think you see this in numerous places, we talked about it when we went through Revelation, but I really think that part of what's happening here at a spiritual level, uh, from the book of Revelation where the dragon pursues the woman, and we talked about how throughout history it's as if Satan launched plans here at a, you know, at, at a seen level, but, but with things going on at the unseen level, to try and keep the Messiah from being born. Because Satan knows that the prophecy is that the son of a woman is going to crush his head. He's going to deal a fatal blow. And so if you can wipe out the Jewish people, you wipe out the possibility of the Messiah. So Pharaoh, again, I, I think, you know, being influenced from demonic sources, decides he is going to kill all the boy babies. And so we're told he commanded all his people saying, every son who's born, you are to cast into the Nile and every daughter you are to keep alive. Now, a series of divine interventions begin to take place at this point. I mean, if you, if you put all of that together, it's, it's a rather bleak you know, situation when we open up the book of Exodus. And the first part of that divine intervention is that God is going to raise up a deliverer. And of course, the name of that deliverer is Moses. Uh, his mom defies Pharaoh. Uh, we know puts the baby boy in a basket. Interesting text, by the way. Let, let, let's read this. The woman conceived, this is Moses' mom, bore a son. And when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. But when she couldn't hide him any longer, she got him a wicker basket. And by the way, the Hebrew word there literally can be translated ark. Okay, So it's like a tiny little ark, you know, kind of connecting back to Genesis a bit covered it with tar and pitch. And remember, same thing, the ark was covered in, and the word related to the whole idea of atonement. Uh, covered it over with tar and pitch, and then she put the child into it and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. Now, you, you probably know the story at this point in time. Uh, the baby's floating down the Nile in the basket, and, uh, and Moses' sister Miriam is walking alongside the river, kind of watching to see what happens. Now, providentially, uh, what happens, and again, oftentimes, I, you know, you, you, you maybe don't explicitly see the hand of God doing something. I mean, we have the, uh, you know, the good fortune of, you know, looking back and knowing what was going on. But I think at the time, you know, you know I think Miriam was probably just, you know, worried. What's going to happen to my brother? I, I'm sure, you know, mom felt the same kind of a way. Baby floats down and there, you know, in the river is Pharaoh's daughter. And so Pharaoh's daughter finds the baby, and, uh, and Miriam steps out and says, oh, you know, if you want this baby, um, would you like me to find someone that can nurse it for you? And Pharaoh's daughter thinks, this is a great idea. And so she gives the baby back to Miriam, who takes it back to mom, and Pharaoh's daughter pays mom to nurse the baby that Pharaoh said needed to get killed. I mean, you know, it's just, it's kind of a cool, you know, little way that, that all of it falls together. And so uh, when the time comes, uh, Moses, and she names him Moses, by the way, that's Pharaoh's daughter's name. The name literally means to draw out. And she's naming him that because he's drawn out of the river, but it's almost prophetic because he's going to be the one that God uses to draw the whole nation out of Egypt. And so he grows up. He's raised as a son of Pharaoh's daughter. And the result of that is that as he's raised in the palace, the book of Acts, we don't see this really in Exodus necessarily, but the book of Acts says that Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. Remember that because something's going to happen that comes back around to that. Well, you, you know the rest of the story. Um, at the age of 40, um, Moses goes out. He sees uh, uh, an Egyptian mistreating uh, uh, one of the, the Jewish slaves. Uh, I, I, think he's, I think he knows at this point in time, perhaps, what his connection is to the people of Israel. It, it makes a lot of sense when you see what follows down line. And he kills, he kills the Egyptian and buries him in the sand, thinking he's you know, covered things up, uh, literally. And, um, but he's been seen. And so it becomes common knowledge that Moses has murdered an Egyptian, and Pharaoh wants to kill him now, and he has to flee. 
and he flees, and he, uh, we're told that he, he ends up in the land of Midian. Now, uh, it's pretty obvious that nobody today is 100% exactly sure where Midian was, but our, our best, uh, you know, not sort of educated hunches is that this would be roughly the location of Midian, which would be the northwest corner uh, of the Arabian Peninsula. Um, interesting, even, you know, how, how often when you're going through the scripture that things in, uh, in the modern world have some sort of connection all the way back. I mean, you know, this is sort of where the 9-11 terrorists came out of, Saudi Arabia. Now we're finding out perhaps even funded out of Saudi Arabia. So this is modern Saudi Arabia. It was, that's where ancient Midian would have been. And Moses flees Egypt ends up in Midian, and he becomes a shepherd. And he becomes a shepherd for 40 years. Now, God is getting him ready for something. And God works in all of our lives to get us ready for something. Hopefully, it doesn't take him 40 years in our case. Uh, but really, what's happening in Moses' life, at least, is that, that a breaking takes place. I mean, he comes, you know, and, and D.L. Moody is famous for the statement that uh, he, he talked about f uh, three sets of 40 years in Moses' life. That for 40 years, Moses spent 40 years thinking he was somebody. You know, so again, educated, house of Pharaoh, powerful, you know, in knowledge, speech. And then God takes him into the wilderness and he spends 40 years learning he's a nobody. And at the end of that 40 years, um, God calls him, by the way, all of us, 80 years old when he's called into ministry, 80. And, um, and, and the last 40 years of his life, Moody said, was the 40 years he discovered what God can do with a nobody who fully trusts God. And, and so you see this in the life of Moses. So at the age of 80, Moses is called by God, and it's a very, you know, and by the way, he's getting ready to go on a mission from God, just like the Blues Brothers, and, um, and at the age of 80 is when he has this, this great experience where as he's, you know, herding sheep uh, there in the desert of Midian, he sees a bush burning, but the bush isn't being consumed, and he goes to see what's going on, and we're told in the text that out of the bush, God speaks to him and basically says to him, go to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. Now Moses asks a very interesting question. Well, if I go to our people, or I go to Pharaoh, and I say this, and they say, ask, who sent me, what shall I say? And in response to that, God reveals something he's never revealed up to this point in time in this whole story of redemption, and that is he reveals to Moses his name. You know, God has a name. God is not a name. God is this general title of a supreme being, but God now reveals himself to Moses, and he, he, he makes the famous statement, uh, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent you. In Hebrew, uh, it's four consonants that are translated I am, and they're uh, part of the Hebrew word to be, and that's where this concept of obviously translate I am is. Um, it, it's an interesting name uh, when we transliterate it, and by the way, Hebrew reads right to left, and so it's a yod, het, vav, het, or the Hebrew letters, but in English we would translate it as Y-H-W-H, although I personally happen to think, as do others, that probably it should be Y-H-V-H, and that rather than Yahweh being the way we pronounce it, it probably would have been Yahweh, but, you know, no, no big deal. Unless you were playing biblical trivia some night, and, you know, and you, this could be a winner. This could change the whole game right there, but... But it's the name of God. And, and it's fascinating because, you know, what, is, you know, what does that name mean? Because a name uh, reveals the nature of a person. And what does it mean when God says, I am, Yahweh is my name? And, and there's really three possibilities there. And I think probably dimensions of all of it tie in. Uh, first of all, that it, it is a, it's a name that would reflect the eternal nature of God. I am. 
He never came into being. He will never go out of being. He has always existed. He is the I am. He is eternal. And that's part of the nature of who God is. The phrase can also be translated, I am the one who causes to be. And in that sense, what it is, it, 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 it's, it's the creator dimension, the omnipotent, all-powerful dimension of God that everything exi- that exists, exists because he caused it to be. He, he brought it into being. And so he's not only eternal, he's omnipotent. And, and then finally, it can be translated, I will be who I will be, which would be a statement of God's sovereignty. That, that, that God is sovereign, that he, he does what he chooses to do, and no one can stop him. And so it, it's a great name that reveals about God that, again, he is the one who, uh, you know, is eternal, he is omnipotent, he is sovereign. This is the God who we worship. And so he reveals himself to Moses. Very uh, important uh, text there in the book of Hebrews, maybe, maybe one of the most important. So Moses goes back, and uh, the story's more complex than that. You should read the book of Exodus, because Aaron figures in here. But he gets back, of course, to uh, Egypt, and he confronts Pharaoh. And of course, Pharaoh isn't going to let uh, the children of Israel go. And so God begins to unleash upon them 10 plagues. And uh, nine of those are are sort of warm-ups, actually. So you have the plague of the Nile turned to blood, frogs, gnats, flies, boils, hail, locusts, darkness. And and in response to all of those, Pharaoh says, no, I'm not letting them go. And it's all leading up to the 10th plague. Uh, by the way, you, uh, this is, you never will read this, but you can find something like this if you search online. One of the things that is fascinating is every one of those plagues had a relationship to one of the gods that Egypt worshipped. And so every plague is basically saying, you think this is a god, watch this. Or you like frogs? Oh, here, you are, here, here come the frogs, you know. So, uh, so there, there's significance to the plagues, but of course the biggie is the death of the firstborn. And so a, a warning is given, you know, that, uh, that on this night, um, that the angel of death is going to pass over the land of, of Egypt and is going to put to death the firstborn of everything, every uh, animal, uh, but particularly every family's firstborn son is going to die unless, unless you do something. And uh, along with the warning, and this is very um, very common when you see how God operates. Same thing with the flood. Warning comes, but there is a, uh, a method of escape, in a sense, the, the ark. Um, here, the method of escape is this, that, he, that God says, here's what you're to do on that night. You're to take a lamb, and you're to put it to death. You're to slay it. And you are to take the blood of that lamb, and you are to, uh, to put it, on the lintel and the doorposts of your house. And if you will do that, when the angel of death uh, executes judgment upon the the land of Egypt, when he sees that upon the doorposts of your house, he will what? Pass over the house. And of course, this becomes the uh, uh, sort of the, the, the central point of identity and worship of the nation of Israel, probably all the way up at least till the time of the Holocaust. Uh, but it happens. Uh, and by the way, you know, um, we talked about this in Corinthians. I, I imagine, maybe not for all of you, but I imagine the first time that maybe you heard about Christ and, uh, and someone said to you, well, you know, you can be, you know, you can be forgiven and uh, the way you can be forgiven and have a relationship with God and actually have eternal life and live forever is uh, Jesus Christ died for you, and he shed, his, he shed his blood for you. And if you will place your faith in him uh, on your behalf and say yes to what he's done for you and invite Christ into your life, um, 
You will be forgiven, you will receive new life, and you will live in eternity in relationship with God, and, and, and it's this amazing promise. And to some people, and maybe to some of us, it just sounds foolish, doesn't it? I mean, it really, it, it sounds a little foolish. I mean, Paul calls it foolish, but it's what God has picked. Now, now think, there's a couple of times where God's going to do things like this, but, but imagine if you're, you know, if you're a Jew uh, at, the, at this point in time, and, uh, and you're given the message, okay, you don't want your firstborn to die, here's what you do. You kill a lamb, you take the blood, you paint your door with it. I mean, it's, it, you know, it's, it sounds a little different, uh, at least, but it's all pointing and foreshadowing what Jesus Christ is going to do. And in a sense, when we come to Christ, of course, the very first thing that John the Baptist says when he sees Jesus coming to be baptized is what? Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Well, he's referring all the way back to this incident. And in a sense, when, when we're confronted with Christ and have to make this decision, and if we say yes to Jesus and open our lives to him, it's as if his blood is painted on the lintel and the doorposts of our heart. And we will not experience death or face death. And so, again, this, this foreshadowing takes place, and you know what happens. The, the angel of death comes upon the land of Egypt, and the firstborn of everyone that has not taken advantage of this way of escape um, it is put to death. And the result is that Pharaoh, uh, he, 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 cha- he, he lets the people of Israel go. And this event, central event, At Passover, it's again, it's a remembrance. Think about this for you know, uh, you know, 1500, see, 1500 BC to 3500 years, 3500 years, Jews have been doing this every year to remember this. And it is interesting, by the way, that in the rest of the world, basically, except the English speaking world, Easter is not called Easter. And there's some question mark as to where that name even comes from, but everybody else in the world calls Easter Passover. And, and, and again, there's this connection of how, for us, that was a foreshadowing of what Jesus Christ would do on the cross for us. So, the nation comes out, uh, they, they, they begin heading toward the promised land, and if you read the text, it's fascinating, because you can kind of think, well, they come to the Red Sea, They don't exactly just come to the Red Sea. They're somewhere else. And God gives specific instructions that maneuvers them into a position where there is a mountain on the left, there is a mountain on the right, there's the Red Sea in front of them, and Pharaoh has changed his mind, and behind them, Pharaoh is coming with 600 chariots. And God gets them into that position. And there's a reason for that, because he's going to reveal to them his power, and his glory. And Moses makes that kind of famous statement, stand back and and, and see what God's going to do. Fear not, stand firm, see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. And God parts the Red Sea. One of the words says that the water is congealed, and the Israelites go through the Red Sea on dry land, and God keeps Pharaoh back by the pillar of cloud, uh, that is his manifestation of his presence that's been guiding them, now goes behind them so that the entire nation can get through, and Pharaoh pursues, he, he sends 600 chariots into the Red Sea, and God brings the water back down, and Pharaoh's army is drowned, and Israel is free. Now, the final part of the book, we move from this incident and now the, the nation moves to the same place where Moses saw the burning bush. Uh, we refer to it oftentimes as Mount Sinai. Uh, it's oftentimes in scripture called Mount Horeb. But when, when God gave Moses the call out of the burning bush, that whole incident, he, he said, here's how you're going to know you know, that I've come through with what I promised, you're going to come back to this same mountain and you're going to worship here. And so they, they, they come through the Red Sea and uh, come to Mount Sinai. Um, oh, that was, let me see what we have here. Traditionally, 
kind of traditionally, this was the way that the route was mapped out. And traditionally, for many, many years, uh, it's been uh, assumed that Mount Sinai, uh, the place that has been identified as it, is there on the Sinai Peninsula. A, a lot of recent research and study uh, has a different idea on that. And would have it, because he was in Midian, of course, we aren't 100% sure where Midian was, but kind of more recent uh, trends in scholarship believe that, that this would be more the location uh, of where Sinai was, that they would have uh, you know, crossed the Red Sea here on this side of the Sinai Peninsula and come across to Mount Sinai there in Midian where Moses encountered God to begin with. And of course, Moses heads up the mountain where he met God before, and there he gets the Ten Commandments. Uh, the Ten Commandments being this, this framework for the moral and social and, and spiritual behavior of what was to become a, a great nation. This is like the constitution of Israel. Now, what does a great nation need? Three elements that a great nation needs. It needs people. So we've just taken 70 people and created 3 million people to be a nation. Uh, it needs geography, which is where they're heading toward, back to the land of Canaan. And it needs a government or a constitution or a set of rules that they're going to live by. And this one is given by God here at Sinai. These are the conditions that are going to be required for them to fulfill their destiny. It's radical in terms of uh, the nations that not only are they going in to conquer, but really in the ancient world, the, the, the righteous nature of the, the law that God gives was radical. Two, we, the Ten Commandments is only the beginning, by the way. Overall, there are 613 commandments that God gives the nation of Israel uh, over time. But the Ten Commandments are sort of a, a summary of that, where the first four are, are vertically focused on our relationship with God. No other gods, keep God number one. Uh, you know, um, no idols. Um, uh, don't take the name of the Lord in vain and keep the Sabbath holy. All having to do with our vertical relationship with God. And then the next six, all horizontal, dealing with our relationships with each other. So again, honor your father and mother, uh, no, no murder, no lying, no stealing, uh, no adultery, and no coveting. All the foundation of what they were to, the kind of way they were to live to be this great nation. And of course, Moses is up on the mountain. What's happening down with the folks? The folks down below, they, they, they're creating the golden calf and having a toga party down at the foot of the mountain, which Dave is going to talk about next week because I'm gone next week and then I'll be back the following week. But Dave is going to, that's what Dave's going to zero in on next week to go a little bit deeper on what was happening there. Final thing that happens here at Mount Sinai is that, uh, that Moses is given a set of instructions to build a tent. Uh, we call it the tabernacle. And this is so important. Sometimes people, you know, when people say, well, the God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the New Testament. The God of the Old Testament was all about rules and laws and performance. The God of the New Testament is God of grace and love and mercy. But the reality is that God's never changed. And so along with the law, which, by the way, had two purposes. Now, they wouldn't have known both purposes at this point in time. But I think the two purposes of the law were, number one, we're told, because it comes 400 years after the promise to Abraham, but, but people, people's fallen nature need restraint. And so the law is given uh, to prohibit and restrain a fallen humanity. But the unseen purpose we're told in the New Testament, was to show the people of Israel that they couldn't keep the law. And consequently, not able to keep the law, God provides a way for their sin to be atoned for and forgiven temporarily. Because all of this is foreshadowing. It's all pointing to what Christ is going to do. And so you have law right at Mount Sinai. You have law and grace. 
You've got the commandments and you've got the tabernacle. Uh, the tabernacle was a place, again, where uh, people would come and offer their sacrifices on the altar there. Um, it, it was a, an expression of the love and mercy uh, of God, and it was a place of grace. The last 15 chapters of Exodus all deal with the construction of the tabernacle. So, I mean, it was very important in the history and the life of Israel. And, and a cutaway of that tent, uh, you know, without being able to go into a lot of detail time-wise, two, two rooms inside of the tent. Uh, the, the forward room was called the holy place. And only priests of Israel could enter in there, and they did, they performed their religious duty. Sacrifice was at an altar outside of this, of the tent, and then they performed their religious duties inside. But the most important part, what was a little 10 cubit by 10 cubit by 10 cubit part of that tent in the back that was called the Holy of Holies. And it was in there in the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. And it was there where once a year the high priest of Israel would bring the blood of atonement on the day of atonement, Yom Kippur. And there inside the Holy of Holies would sprinkle that blood on the mercy seat over the Ark of the Covenant to, in, in a sense, cover the sins of the nation for that year. And by the way, when he went in, they tied a rope to his foot in case he didn't come out, in case God didn't accept it and you had to pull him out, dead anyway. But, but so, and again, all of this kind of foreshadowing ultimately what Christ would do. And so, the, again, the, the, the end of the book uh, all has to do with the construction of this. And let me take you right there. Um, the people now freely bring what they began to use with the golden calf, you know, they have plundered the Egyptians. And, uh, and when I, I talked about this in Corinthians again, but, you know, it's kind of like the same choice we always have. Are we going to use what God has entrusted us with to build a golden calf or to build the tabernacle? And the intention of why God had them plunder the Egyptians was because he knew he was going to have them build the tabernacle. And so Moses calls for people, you know, to, uh, to bring what uh, their resources in order to, to build the tabernacle. And it's so effective uh, that Moses has to stop them bringing. No more. You know, we got all, all we need. Are, you're waiting for me to say that on a Sunday morning. I know, you know. Oh, no, no, anyway. Um, and, uh, and, and along with that, he's, he's endowed certain people with uh, gifts of craftsmanship, sort of Old Testament spiritual gifts. They're told everything is to be made exactly like God instructs them because Later, we're going to find out in the book of Hebrews that this is like a, a model, an earthly model of heavenly realities. Everything is to be made exactly like God instructs it. And so the tent is set up. Everything is done exactly as God instructs. And the book comes to an end. Oh, I was, I didn't need that. Okay. The book comes to the end. We read this. Moses set up the courtyard around the tabernacle and altar, put up the curtain at the entrance to the courtyard. And so Moses finished the work, and here's how God responds. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And with that, the exit is complete. Uh, the heart and soul of the commandments uh, is delivered. The, uh, the tabernacle is erected and set up, and, and the nation is now ready for the operating instructions for the priesthood and the sacrificial system, which is found at our next exit, the book called Leviticus, which we'll look at in two weeks. And I'd say if there's a takeaway take from any of this, again, as you read this and you remember everything that happens in Exodus, again, is this word foreshadow. It all foreshadows the coming of Jesus Christ and what he has done on our behalf for us. Let's pray. Lord, you are a great deliverer. And I know as we go along, we'll, we'll look a little more at this and, and how their journey uh, out of Egypt and through the wilderness and into the promised land is really a picture of our spiritual journey. But, but certainly, Lord, we, uh, we're grateful that uh, that you, you are a God not only of holiness and righteousness, which you are, but also a God of love and mercy. And Lord, to, to see the great deliverance of the people 
of Israel and to see the, the lamb slain and the blood applied and knowing, Lord Jesus, that you are the lamb of God and that you have taken away the sins of the world. And, and in all of our lives, Christ, we just open ourselves to you in new and fresh ways and, and uh, are grateful, grateful for all that you've done and how it, this book so mirrors uh, our own experience and uh, grateful this morning to be able to, uh, to blow through it Fast, I know, Lord, but uh, hopefully helpful. In your name we pray, amen.